Officials from the Federal Aviation Administration say there were no aircraft incidents or accidents in this area Tuesday night, but multiple witnesses report seeing a large blue object fall out of the sky and into the ocean. Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. So in this short video, I'm going to talk to you about a much less discussed area of the UAP phenomena, which is USOs, or Unidentified Submerged Objects. We've all seen on YouTube and the mainstream media people talking about Tic Tacs and jellyfish UFOs and spheres within cubes flying around in our airspaces. But one thing that we very rarely touch on is what happens beneath the ocean. Now, Earth being the second worst named planet in the solar system is actually 70% water. We're really an ocean planet. But because there's not many ways for humans to make money, and it's pretty hard for humans to survive down there, we don't go there very much. So we have a huge sensor bias, terrestrially, as opposed to in the water. This means that there are entire ecosystems which we're still discovering new facets of on an almost daily basis. And there's such a less of a human presence down there that there's a lot more room for exploration and discovery. So this is going to be a video discussing some of the historical accounts which go back miles into history before the modern scientific age. It's going to talk about some very modern ones with lots of scientific data. And then it's going to have a little peek into perhaps what's coming up with some of the key figures investigating the phenomena as it stands today. We're going to be covering quite a wide spectrum of topics. So there is going to be quite a lot of speculation, but I'll give you fair warning of that. There's also going to be a few scientific explanations for what some of these phenomena may be as well. So hopefully somewhere in the middle we'll find a bit of a balance. But at the end of the day, as I try and do in all my videos, the idea is that you form your own conclusions or investigate further based on the things that you see in this video. So without further ado, let's get into it. Long before man's ambition reached the stars and space, we explored the Earth and its oceans with similar vigour. Eyewitnesses would take journals with them as they went on huge unknown voyages, exploring every corner that they could find, often bringing back incredible tales of magical beasts and mythical lands as they reported back to their respective rulers. Obviously, there's not a huge amount that we can draw for this with relation to the UAP field, but for the human experience, it seems the ocean has always been a place to inspire our fears and wonders throughout history. As awesome and inspiring as some of these ancient tales are, there's really not a lot that we can draw from in terms of hard data to investigate this field. Therefore, let's wind the clock forwards a few hundred years to where we can look at these accounts with a slightly more modern mindset. Now, just before we do so, I just want to mention that a lot of these historical accounts I'm about to go through are the collected work of Richard Dolan, a legend in the UFO field, a fantastic guest on the UAP Files podcast. He did a brilliant interview with Jimmy, and I really recommend you check that out. So hopefully these will inspire you, rather than me cutting and pasting his work into my own, to go to his website, richarddolanmembers.com, or his YouTube channel, where you can see a far deeper dive, pardon the pun, on all of these accounts. Okay, prepare to be dazzled by some cutting edge visuals. Bear in mind I have a budget of absolutely zero. I tried to use Google Earth Studios to demonstrate where these cases took place, so wish me luck. So the first sighting in 1880 was in the Persian Gulf, where J.W. Robertson at 11.30pm saw an enormous luminous wheel beneath the sea. Its spokes were two to three hundred yards long. No light was visible above the water, and three witnesses saw it approach their ship slowly, move alongside it for a time, and then move off with great velocity. The second sighting in 1906 in a very nearby Gulf of Oman, where Douglas Carnegie saw shafts of brilliant light which swept beneath the bow of their ship with prodigious speed, travelling between 60 to 200 miles per hour. Each of these bars was guessed to be 20 feet apart. Also, when you bear in mind that this was two to three years before the Wright brothers managed to leave the ground with the first powered flight, there was nothing mechanical that could have achieved this. The third sighting, one year later, in the Malacca Strait, 
where the steamship Delta saw shafts of light moving around a centre like the spokes of a great wheel. Again, these were guessed to be 300 yards long. The South China Sea in 1910, a horizontal wheel turning rapidly. In 1950, at the Black Sea at Sevastopol Naval Base, a UFO was observed to rise out of the ocean behind a Russian battlecruiser. A photograph was taken and many witnesses saw it, but unfortunately this has now been lost to history. In 1965, in the Red Sea, the steamship Raduga, at two miles distance, saw a 200-foot orange sphere rise out of the water. It hovered at 500 feet above sea level and was mentioned in several Russian news outlets. 1967, just off the east coast of South America, the Argentinian ship Naviero at 6.15pm saw a large glowing object 50 feet from starboard. Cigar shaped, roughly 110 feet long, made no noise and no wake. With a rough speed of 25 knots, it suddenly dived and passed under their ship with great speed. Now for a peculiar case. In 1974, off the coast of Togo in Africa, at 1.45am, two witnesses that were on the beach saw a large cylindrical object just above the water fly towards them. It stopped abruptly and fired large light beams towards them and brought with it a great wave of water which struck across the beach and went into the trees to which they were holding on. This sighting lasted around 20 minutes and over the next few days both witnesses showed great symptoms of radiation exposure. So I hope you found that interesting, I certainly did. Uh, there, there's certain trends in there that you can see, this idea of a wheel of light with the spokes of different colours rotating around it seems to pop up again and again. Now, I'm not going to jump to any conclusions of what they were or weren't, but um, it would appear to be the same thing, whatever that may be. So we have got a lot more technical data of the next three cases that I'm going to talk about, which, to be fair, are probably just as famous to people coming into the field now as Roswell is to the old school investigators back in the day. So the first of which is the Tic Tac encounter from November 2004. There are hour long deep dives into this, so I'm not going to retread the same ground again. But I will just give you a quick summary of it and point out some things that I feel are left out um, by people that are trying to criticize or debunk this encounter. So it happened on November 2004 where the USS Princeton, which was a cutting edge radar ship fitted with passive array radar, uh, over the course of several days detected multiple objects in the air over a US Navy training ground area, which was over the sea. On this particular day, 10 objects were detected, showing as being approximately 47 feet long, bear that in mind. And so David Fravor and Alex Dietrich, who were on their training mission, were rerouted to go and investigate the phenomena. Um, he said that when he got there, the Tic Tac itself, which was described because it looks like a breath mint, was pinging around in a cross shape over some white water. So hence the, the USO connection. He also said that it maneuvered, and this is collated by the radar data, with the what would be effectively 1350 G on it, had it been a conventional craft with conventional propulsion. Now, two of the main arguments of this by people that frankly aren't qualified to make them are that it was seagulls, which is okay fine bear in mind this guy is a top gun instructor so it's his job to identify things with his eyeballs because there's a very good chance that if he misidentifies something he's going to die so <laughs> not to make too much of a fuss about it but i think we can pretty much err on commander fravor's side of that also one of the other main theories that i've seen on youtube is that it was a substance called aerogel now aerogel 
basically is this foam that's on my microphone here. It's a very, very fine, very light, incredibly uh, um, floaty substance, which you can make balloons out of. Um, so if you want something to hang in the air for a very long time, which is reportedly a characteristic of them, then it's a really good thing. What it can't do is accelerate and move around and change direction with anything like the velocity that the Tic Tac was purported to do. For example, they said at the end of the encounter it travelled 60 miles in a second. So I don't think that that's frankly possible. And unfortunately, lots of the videos on YouTube that will suggest this theory will cherry pick the little bits of data that it looks a bit like it and can have such a long linger time. So I'm just trying to present full facts. Another often used criticism is that it was some form of drone. Now, for there to have been 10 of them detected with a linger time of hours and hours, and for them to be 100 miles off the south coast, that, to me, unless there's somebody that knows a lot better, rules out almost any drone because, first of all, unless it's launched from a boat out there, which didn't happen because you've got the US Navy's Nimitz and Princeton and, and some pretty serious kit there, so that, that just didn't happen. Um, so for a drone to get there, first it's got to fly 100 miles, maintain its signal for 100 miles, which alone I know is possible, but as each of these suggestions get more complex, the cost in exponentially increases as well. Um, so yeah, 10 of them, 47 foot long drones that can move unlike any other mechanical craft that we're aware of. I don't think so, unless somebody knows a bit better. So that's the Tic Tac. The next two very well known pieces of footage were taken off the coast of Virginia Beach in America in 2014 and 15, where the Red Rippers, um, including Ryan Graves, were launched from the USS Theodore Roosevelt and as they were having their infrared systems upgraded they started detecting lots and lots of sources of infrared energy. Upon closer investigation they were revealed to be what's described as a cube within a sphere and were so prolific in the air that Ryan Graves had to issue a flight safety warning to the rest of the fleet as they were an obstruction and on a couple of occasions almost caused a mid-air collision with some of his fellow pilots. This footage came to the attention of Admiral Tim Gulladet, who was the Navy's chief meteorologist. He's since joined the Salt Foundation with another prominent physicist, Kevin Knuth, and are both are doing fantastic work on the USO field. I really recommend you watch their presentations from the recent SOL conference as they go into great detail about the USO field in particular and show that their investigations are ongoing. These last three videos were also shown during the first congressional hearing during which Ryan Graves, David Fravor and David Grush all provided testimony about these events and many others. And again, I very much recommend having a look on YouTube and watching the whole thing because it's fascinating. Okay, now this next one is pretty much my favorite video. Um, I'm going to show you two different versions of it. One with it kind of zoomed in and highlighted to show you what we're looking at. And then the second one will be completely unedited. So it was taken 2012 in Puerto Rico at the Aguadilla Airport, which I'm probably pronouncing terribly, but forgive me. Um, Puerto Rico is a real hotspot for activity of this type, as I covered in my investigation into the dogfight had between two F-14 Tomcats and a UFO in a previous video. Anyway, this video taken on a heat camera from a helicopter shows an object which is between three and five feet across, traveling at various velocities against the wind, um, it shows, because it's on a heat camera, it was 40 degrees Celsius or 101, I think that is in Fahrenheit. Um, the point being, it's nothing with an engine because these things tend to be very, very hot. And as the object moves across the camera, it moves across the airfield, out over the water, dips in and out of the water, and then splits into two. So it's definitely not a seagull, unless it's a very, very unlucky one. 
Um, have a little look, see what you think. There's no other conclusions to be drawn from it, but it's fascinating and it really demonstrates the trans medium nature of these craft. So transmedium is the ability to move in between different environments. So for example, from air into water and back out again, or from air into space, you could consider air, land, sea, and space, different mediums all within the earth realm. Um, now, there are many accounts of UFOs and supposedly solid objects moving into solid rock and cliff faces and whatnot. They've talked about that on the Skinwalker Ranch and many other eyewitness accounts over the years. Now, I am by no means clever enough to offer any theories on that unless it's some form of extreme gravitational lensing which can affect the atomic bond of the matter that it's passing through. But like I said, I'm no physicist, so I'm not going to give you any theories about that. What I can show you is how difficult it is 
for our conventional technology to move in a transmedium way. Um, this video I'm about to show you is of a boat which is also slightly submersible and you can see it can work under the water to a certain degree or on top of it but as it moves between the two it drastically loses control because there's so much less resistance from the air than the water. These USOs and UFOs appear to show absolutely no problem with that. Neither is there any cavitation, which is the production of bubbles. Now, there are lots of USO encounters which just show up on sonar or radar as traveling at immense velocities under the water. The reason I haven't included any of them is because I, in my childlike wonder, have a theory about how a man-made craft could bypass the problems that we supposedly have with a high pressure environment like moving through water. Um, the problems that water pressure has on a crafter is the immense strain and that's only amplified as you push more out of the back it's going to crush like a coke can against a solid wall of water that's why a um, high diver puts their hands in front of them first to get into the water and break through into that medium. So I would like to know if it were possible to induce what's known as the Leidenfrost effect whereby you superheat the leading edge of your craft and that part of you which is going to be penetrating the water itself uh, to about 300 degrees that would then vaporize the water as it comes into contact and create a cushion of air so essentially the back of the craft where your propeller is is pushing against the nice hard medium of water and giving it extra traction like spikes on a running shoe whereas the front of it is passing into steam as opposed to this solid wall of water. I would imagine in my ignorance that if you could induce that effect there would be nothing stopping you from traveling with exceptionally high speed and that's why I've not included any of those other USL reports because if I were Lockheed or any of these um, hugely powerful tech companies I would have at least tested it. Now after all that dodgy science I feel it's only fair to close the video out with an equally hefty dose of speculative mythology. So I want to take you back to the start of the video where we were talking about some of the historical cases particularly around the region of the Gulf of Oman or Mesopotamia which means between two rivers which is what we now know as Iran and the surrounding area. Now the main civilization of the time were the Sumerians from ancient Sumer. And in their ancient texts, which still exist to this day, they mention a character known as Oannes, who would emerge from the water dressed from head to toe in the skin of a fish, but with a man's head and toes underneath. Now, let's not forget that humans define their definition of reality by their associations and the things that they know, which is why uh, the first disc that we saw in the sky was described as a flying saucer because obviously he knew what a saucer was and if you saw something shiny particularly coming out of the water at that time pre-metal pre-bronze age um, you would perhaps think it was the scales of a fish that is speculation but I'm just trying to overlay it with a modern interpretation what isn't an interpretation though is that they said that Oanes would emerge from the water and teach them. So introduce them to farming, to governance, to science and the basis of technology and various different inventions which allowed their civilization to flourish in a very difficult environment. Was this then the earliest record of NHI emerging from the water or USOs? I'll leave that for you to decide. But we can't just discount these ancient accounts as their civilization lasted a lot longer than our modern one has so far. Anyway, thank you very, very much for watching this video, particularly if you made it this far. I really, really appreciate it. I am only a little channel and I hate begging for likes and subscriptions. But since I'm a small channel, if you hit those little buttons, it will have a much bigger effect. Uh, and I'd really, really appreciate it. So take it easy and I'll see you in the next one.